Okay, okay. recording. So welcome everybody. I'm gonna call this meeting of the budget coordinating group to order. We'll start with a roll calls, see um, who can be heard. So Andy Steinberg. Yes, I'm here. Lynn Griesmer. Present. Um, Alison McDonald. Present. Bob Pam. Here. Um, Mandy Johanneke. Present. Peter Demling. Peter present. And Lynn Griesmer. I'm, You're still, right, I'm still present. You're still present. So then we, and we have our staff here. Did I get everybody? Yeah, we're down one library trustee. Um, okay. I want the front if we do another meeting. Okay. Uh, and Sean, do you want to show the agenda? Can you share the, share the agenda? Uh, yes, I can. If you give me one second. So the goal of today's meeting is to share information, um, update you on where we are on some of the, um, uh, on our financial situation and review the calendar that we're, that we're proposing to do for the, for the coming budget season. And now that you've shared the agenda, I found it, so. <laughs> it's good to share anyway. <laughs> um, do you see it on the screen? It's coming, yes. Actually, is this no, this is not the right ones. So I think where did I that was an old agenda, sorry. Yeah. Um that was from last year. Where the heck is it? Do we have to select it into a chair? Or you just run? Oh no, here it is. Here it is. Sorry, wrong one. Um I th What's yeah. on? I we determined your we chair gonna... under the charter, Paul. Okay, good. Okay, so the first thing we will do is ask for public comment. I see no one in the audience or in attendees. So seeing that, we will move on from public comment and we'll go to charter tuition adjustment. And then the other things we'll talk about is the budget, as I said before. So Sean, you wanna talk about the budget charter? Yeah, I mean, I think Peter, if you wanna, so I'll just give a really, really quick overview and then turn over to Peter. So the schools, um, I believe had a public conversation last, um, last spring maybe about the the charter tuition adjustment and Peter did some exploration into what other communities do um, and so with that I'll turn it over to Peter yeah thanks um, so I, I will try to keep this brief in light of the rest of the agenda so we can get out in a reasonable time um, so yeah so this is something um, I, I looked at over the course of last year and and it took me a while to fully understand it so thank you to uh, both Doug and Sean for meeting with me multiple times to kind of understand all the the machinations um, but basically, you know, this is um, looking at the idea of um, uh, could we look at changing how the charter, the town's charter costs are, are accounted for uh, with the town budget and the school budget. So just, just as a very brief overview without going into every detail, but we can go into them if we, if we want to. Um, the, the state charges the town for uh, any charter tuition um, of residents that go to charter schools. Uh, the state reimburses the town directly for some of that annual increase. It's pretty small at this point. It's also subject to appropriation. Um, just to give you an idea of order of magnitude, it's about 1.6 million, the tuition bill these days, and, and you get reimbursed for about 5% of that. So, um, so it's, most of that is charged. Um, and then um, the, during the budget process cycle, which is what we're talking about here, uh, when the guidance first comes out, the school budget is then either adjust it up or down based on the difference of the net charter cost from the previous um, budget cycle. Uh, so if, if the tuition minus reimbursement one year was 1.5 million and then it was 1.6 million the next year, uh, then, it, then it goes down 100,000 and, and, and whatnot. So this is why you see, um, instead of say a, a year that where the guidance is two and a half, the schools are 2.32 or 2.61 or, or whatnot. Um, the, the, the choice um, out and in also factors into this. I'm going to put that on hold for a moment because just so we've talked about the charter um, stuff. So, so this is actually the, the jumping off point for wanting to explore it because I've always found it very difficult to understand and explain. And I found it a constant point of confusion where people are asking, why aren't the schools getting as much as everybody else? Or why are they getting more than 
and and you know it's 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 not the case. Um, it's it's made further complicated by the fact that when you run the numbers, you need to use um, two years prior. So because uh, the numbers aren't final. So uh, for example, on the FY23 budget process, we we were using FY21 um, numbers, and so it further um, disconnects you from the from the current. So this this all seemed kind of difficult and and complex to me, and so um, I wanted to understand how other communities do it. So I reached out. To as many districts as I could, um, and um, uh, finance directors, superintendents, and whatnot, and so I was able to get here back definitively from 25 school districts, mostly from our area. Uh, and it turns out most of them don't do it the way we do. Most of them, um, the town budget absorbs the cost, and then whatever guidance the schools are going to get, the schools are going to get. So I heard back from 25 districts, and of those, 20. Um, uh, just absorb the cost and then do the, the guidance. Um, so these are um, towns like Belchertown, Northampton, um, Sunderland, Deerfield, East Hampton, a, a lot of the communities to, directly around us. Um, so, um, so yeah, so, so the, the impact of, of doing it one way or the other, um, you know, and this might be obvious to you, but this is kind of a, the, the idea is that if, uh, if there's an increase in charter costs, then the the schools uh, um, absorb the cost uh, fully in the uh, current model. Whereas if, if, it, if the town just pays for it directly like, like most communities do, then the whole town uh, absorbs the cost. And so all the town departments, including the schools, absorb that cost, but in a lesser degree, right? And then conversely, if we're doing better on charter schools uh, and tuition, uh, in the current model, the, town, the school budget benefits directly uh, whereas if it was a town cost, all town departments, including the schools, would benefit more from, from a, uh, to a lesser degree. Um, so, so in addition to the trans, uh, when I say transparency, it just seems like it being simpler and clearer to communicate to the public about what the school's budget actually is in the context of the town. Um, that, that's, this is another benefit from, from switching that I was interested in in exploring this is, is just the decreased volatility for the school budget, um, you know, we're, we've absorbed 1.6 million about directly, which works out to about 6% of our net school spending. And so there's there's a cap on uh, statewide 9% of net school spending. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, it, it, it could go up, it could go down in the future, you know, who knows who knows what tomorrow will bring. Um, but the the idea of, of getting that smoothing out projection for the schools uh, really appealed to me. Um, I also really like the idea of, of increasing uh, the working partnership between the town and the schools, and and you know seeing seeing the fact that providing a quality public service like the schools is really a shared responsibility between the town and the schools, and one can't function without the other, right? People move to town because of the schools, but you don't do that unless the town also has other excellent services, and um, you know people, and so you know one one helps out the other and whatnot, and so. Um, yeah, so that was that was uh, really the basis for wanting to explore this, and, um, and and thank you to Sean and Paul for helping me understand the details and the history and whatnot. Yeah, so um, so just to summarize the request, I think the request is to stop uh, modifying the allocation to the schools by any changes in charter each year, right? That's sort of the the specific request for um, the town manager to consider for the budget. Yeah, yeah, and, and to be clear, you know, no one, no one on school committee has expressed any desire to completely reverse and revert history. So, no, we're not asking for a one point six million dollar credit to right. schools next fiscal year. I think that would be very. One could argue that on pure principle, I suppose, but that's I think that's, in my view, unreasonable and impractical right. to, to request. But from this point onwards, you know, we sort of start with what the what the, the school budget is now and just, you know, go forward with, with whatever the guidance uh, is. Chair Bachelman, is it okay if I? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, so, I, so you know, I, I was aware that the school committee was discussing this. Um, we've had conversations about this in the past. I think two reasons to consider it are one, it is super complicated. It's something we have to explain every single year. And, and some people remember going as far back to Sandy Pooler in front of town meeting doing a little skit and to try to explain it to 300 town meeting members. Um, but it, it's always been very confusing to explain why the elementary schools get either more or less in a given year um, because of this change. And then the other thing that um, I can put the back up on the screen if anyone has any, wants to see it again, but um, 
charter enrollment has sort of stabilized, at least at the elementary level. And so the last five years, there's been up years and then there's been down years. Um, so some years the assessment is, the allocation to the schools is reduced, some years it's increased, um, but they're relatively small adjustments. And it's, you know, is it worth the confusion um, to, you know, to people looking at it to, to make those small adjustments? Mm -hmm. Mandy? Thanks. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is about the history of how this happened into the budget, which is I I could be wrong, but I remember at some point that didn't we remove all charter tuition costs from the school budget and put them on a different line within the whole sort of budget in the town at some point and then reduced the school um, I guess budget operating budget by that same amount and the I, I'm not sure the reason behind that but when we did that didn't that actually make this more complicated that now so we're seeking another right. solution for um and what was the reasoning behind that um and then I'll ask my second question so Sonia will want to jump in on this but yeah the, the charter and choice used to be in the school budget and it was in the town budget it was in both places and what it, the school would have it in their budget based on a couple years prior, because we wanted it to show up in the educational budget back then somehow. Um, and Sonia can speak to, I don't know if it was our auditors or the Department of Revenue that basically said, you can't have it in two places. And it's a really complicated, it was a, it was a even more complicated mechanism back then. I think it's less complicated now, um, but we're not all the way sort of to, to where it's you know very simple. But Sonia, if you wanted, what did the DOR say about that? Well, I don't particularly understand it well myself either, but this was, an attempt by um, Nancy Maglione when she was the finance director to show the true cost of education. So she was booking all of the, um, the budgets for the school for the cherry sheet receipts that came in and cherry sheet charges. So we would adjust our cherry sheet figures when we were setting the tax rate. We were netting the difference for the tax rate and then we were appropriating the true cost of the school and the school operating budget. And it was a nightmare to figure out every year and to explain it to people. At one, at one point, the Department of Revenue said, no, you can't do this. You know, you book the cherry sheet the way the cherry sheet comes in and you internally somehow figure out the true cost of education. So we had to do that. But this was left over from that with the um, cherry sheet where we would adjust the, um, the difference in choice and charter from the base. We always increased their base. We always kept that at two and a half percent and made the adjustment after the fact. But I agree, this is something that should just be straightforward. And there are other ways now to get the true right. cost of education. The, the right. DESE reports, they fold in charter tuition into um, per pupil cost, for example, when you look at that. So there, are, there, are, there may not have been ways back then to see the total cost of education, but the reports that are out there now do that. Yeah. Um, my second one might go beyond this particular group. Um, but and, and it goes beyond whatever we feel individually about the benefit or not benefit of charter schools. But the original, my understanding, the original um, in, impetus behind charter schools was to improve all public school education, including the potentially in, uh, creation of new programs within public schools. Um, and that's why they have this coming out of public school budgets. And I could have some of this history wrong. But, um, and so my question is if the whole town um, takes on the burden of charter school tuition instead of just the schools, um, does that decrease the impetus for our school committee and our school department to improve the schooling and quote, compete? And I know Peter hates the word compete, um, but compete with the charter schools, you know, such that, for example, had the schools not had that burden of it coming out of their budget, would we have been thinking about creating, say, commandantes to compete with the chart, the Chinese charter school? So it, I don't know if that's a conversation for today, but you know, the library department, the DPW, 
can do really nothing to bring students back into our schools from charter schools, but the elementary school can, but if it's not on their budget, does that change the, the considerations there? Peter? Yeah, I, I think it's completely appropriate question for this, this scope of discussion. Um, I mean, my short feeling on it is, is no, it, it doesn't decrease the school's motivation. Um, well, so one, just for Caminantes, um, Yes, it is a nice side benefit that we have that we have a dual language immersion program, and that that, that could be a differentiator for somebody who was considering the the single language immersion of, of Chinese at the charter. Um, and and that that may well be true um, that that bears out as a benefit. However, the, the primary motivation for Caminantes is to really is to, is to reach um, Spanish na native Spanish speaking English language learners because research bears out that. That's the most effective intervention uh, approach, um, and um, I know I know it gets it gets confused sometimes because it has these other side benefits, right? There's a, another side benefit which is huge about embracing different cultures and values, and which is uh -huh. amazing. Um, and there's a great video out by the way that Arps just put out today that we should share um, hmm. that really highlights Caminantes in a super joyous way. as a sidebar. Um, so, so that's so I think Caminantes st still would have existed, but but in the in the more general question of you know does does it put the schools on a less concerned or activist footing when it comes to charter schools. I don't. I don't think so. And I, and I, I. I say this based on my last six year plus years of fighting charter schools, for lack of a better term, locally and and statewide. In in that, um, like when I my first foray into this, when I was fighting the first expansion back in 2017, I had no idea how this was accounted for. <laughs> so it, it didn't factor into my um, equation and. Um, you know, over the years, the school committee members that I've encountered statewide who are the most passionate about this and who do the most for at least the ones I've run into, like um, Mike Knapp in Belchertown, uh, Laura Fallon in Northampton, uh, Andrew Lipsitt in Woburn, um, uh, these, these communities, they all have the accounting in which it comes in, into the, the town budget. So, um, and, and there's, a, and there's a, a towns that don't do it who where where you you don't have Abby, you know. So I don't think there's correlation between how it's accounted for. Um, it, that might be different if if uh, if we were talking if we turned the way back machine to 2007 and we had zero charter cost right now, and we were talking about you know differences of potentially you know hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions, um, you know year to year or, or year to a couple of years. But at this point, you know we've absorbed you know two, we're two thirds of the way to our net school spending, right? We've absorbed 1.6 million. Um, so I, th I think um, I think that the motivation to advocate for charter school uh, reform will be there in in the hearts and minds and and to do lists of the public servants and community members who who are passionate about it. Um, and uh, and I you know I, I I think I think it helps to to promote this as as a uh, as, it's a civic funding reform that needs to happen, right? I mean this is a state charge to the town, and so it affects. However, you want to account for it. It affects the town, and the schools affect the town. The town affects the schools, whatnot. So, um, yeah. But that's just that's just my my take from my experience. Thanks, Peter. Andy. Yeah, it would seem to me, and uh, but I want to see what Ellison and Peter and Doug have to say about this. That um, because the uh, regional schools still absorb all of the consequences of charter that there's a real motivation amongst our school committee members who all serve on the regional school committee to try and encourage participation in public schools because once you lose kids at the beginning um you might uh, you know you whether you get them back at the end is question mark and so uh, i would hope that there's an incentive amongst school committee um, to continue to try and keep kids in our public schools elementary because that sets them on a track that also affects the region so i think it's a dual great thanks allison yeah interested i i hadn't thought about the the impact on the region as well but um i think you know, it's sort of building on, on something that Peter said about not understanding the, the the cost calculation and sort of how that funding works. I think, you know, I don't 
know that I'm speaking out of school to say that I don't think a lot of new members on the school committee are, are completely aware of how that funding mechanism works and it takes time before we do. And yet that the impact of charter schools on our on our elementary schools is is multi-layered it's not just this this funding um the tuition but it's also the enrollment numbers which impact our um our chapter 70 funding and other sort of enrollment driven um funding mechanisms and i and i think that's something that as a school committee member and i do see that in our conversations um over the years in the school committee we do talk about that and that is sort of that's sort of the easy mnemonic for us to understand and really sort of keep track of the competition, if you will, that we're getting from um, from charters. Um, and then that the tuition cost is just sort of the thing that we can point to to say how that's impacting. And that doesn't go away whether it's absorbed by the town or the the schools directly, because we get impacted on a couple different levels when when a student chooses a charter school over um, our own elementary schools. Um, so yeah, that, that's all. I, I have more, but um, but not sort of directly, and it's not really well formed at this point. So <laughs> I'll, just, I'll stop now. <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, are there any other kinds of charges or payments like, excuse me, like this that um, would also that we're opening the door to? That's my first question. My second question is in a next budget of FY24, what how much are we talking about in terms of the shift? So uh Chair Bockelman, is it okay if I yeah, respond sure. to? You? Um so again, looking back, it, the shift is almost nothing if we were to uh it, our net cost was one point uh one million five hundred and thirty-eight thousand in FY21. Our cost in FY22 is 1,536,000. So it's about a $2,000 shift if we stick with the, sort of the historical look back. Um, so it's a good year to make that shift because um, it's a very negligible um, adjustment. Um, and we don't know what FY23 looks like. We, we won't have FY23 actuals when we um, finalize the budget. So so that's a, a good, it's a, it's a minor adjustment. Um, and then in terms of other things, there's nothing else like this. Um, where unless Sonia, you know, Sonia, correct me if I'm wrong. There's nothing else like this where we, you know, go back and look at historical costs. And then, I mean, you can just look at our operating budgets with the schools, the region, um, with the elementary schools, the region, the library, um, and the town. There's no other adjustments made to those other operating budgets. This is the only adjustment we make. And besides um, the auditor's advice to not book a number twice, thank you very much. Hmm. Um, the uh, is there have they ever given us any other thoughts or advice with regard to this um based on their experience with other towns? Sonia, to my knowledge. Sonia. Um, no, this this adjustment really they wouldn't they wouldn't see that because it's just our increase in the budget every year. So they wouldn't look at that. But when we were adjusting the actual charity sheet receipts on the tax rate. That was right in their face. So that's why they questioned that. Okay. Right. And then I guess my other thought was that if we did this, is there, suppose we start having some wild swings? And we had a couple of those at the regional level, particularly because of COVID, um, and maybe even some at the elementary level. Is there a point where we say, you know, we'll absorb it up to X or something like that. You mean guardrails, Lynn? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> guardrails. That is what I would mean. <laughs> like if, if a new school opened up, is what, like right. that possibility. Yeah, and like all of a sudden, you know, we have some serious payment out or we have some other change the the even the other way i guess but yeah i mean it, it could go the other way there's a lot of you know there's a lot of effort out there and we have a new governor coming in to increase reimbursements for charter right charter tuition reimbursements are pretty minimal at this point so it could certainly go the other way too where there's more revenue coming in but i think if there is a new school or a huge you know significant expansion we would need to get all hands on deck to see how that would impact the town um 
it, it would, you know, last time it happened, it had a really significant impact on the, the budgets. Mm -hmm. Peter? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, two thoughts. I mean, one, you know, if there was ever an extraordinary unanticipated situation, you know, obviously that would be part of that fiscal year's discussion between, you know, the town and, and the schools about, uh, you know, are the schools going to get a different increase substantially up or down from that? Um, you know, so, I mean, that's a conversation, I guess, for the future people who sit at these Zoom meetings. <laughs> um, you know, more, more generally, though, um, I mean, I would think, and my feeling is that um, one of the benefits of, of it is, is that that volatility is, is sh and that, that so the benefit and, and the cost of, of the volatility, you know, up or down is, is, is shared across um, the departments and is a shared responsibility of the town and the school, which I, which I see is a good thing. You know, like, like the town is doing an unbelievable job at uh, supporting and promoting the new building project and residents are obviously gonna, you know, be a part of that. So, and having this amazing new building is clearly gonna be an enrollment draw for some families. You know, it's going to factor into the equation. I, I don't know exactly how, how much, but you know, one would expect a positive impact on enrollment um, for that. Um, so I don't think that the school budget should be the sole direct beneficiary of that because, you know, it's, it's, it's a combination. The school committee has to do a good job overseeing the schools and spending the money that we have wisely. And the town has to do a good job, you know, funding the schools at a level they, they think is appropriate. So I, I, I feel like, you know, all ships together on, on the rising and uh, or troughing seas is, is, is th the way to go. Um, and which is like one of the appeals for me about this. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, you know, if there's some 10 orders of magnitude situation in <laughs> one way or the other, that would be a discussion for a future, uh, yeah. future body. So it seems like we should plan on doing this for this year. It's something that could always be brought up for discussion uh, during the, the troughing seas. Um, so um, if that, if there, unless there's objection, I think we should just plan. This is a perfect year to do it. That's what our conclusion has been. So, and we may find out that it's a bad decision. I don't think we will, but um, we. This is a. a um, but I think going forward, this is the way should we should be accounting and projecting. Okay, Sean, FY23, or Mandy, I'm sorry. Thank you. Everybody. Sorry, just, just one more question. Um, where does it, does it just show up in the cherry sheet now in the budget and then those adjustments with the school such that if we go to this new method, like how does that ensure it's across all the departments since general government gets its two and a half? Is it in general government? Is it somewhere else? Like where it's, is it right now? It's in, um, it's in the state assessments and the state aid, which we're actually going to look at in a second, so I can show you kind of where okay. they show up. But um, the, the assessments and the reimbursement show up there. The difference would be, you know, whether it was an increase or decrease to the schools, that would have been more in that general pot to divvy up for other things. That that'll just won't happen because um, we won't make that adjustment. Okay. Thanks, Bob. You're muted, Bob. It may be improper for me to ask a question about the school budget, but uh, <clears throat> during the period of construction, which is likely to go on for two years, um, that will have some impact on people's decisions about where they're going. And if if that means that some percentage of kids will will be shifted out, and you're telling me that there that is likely to have longer term impacts on whether they come back. Um, I'm just wondering about, you know, has some thought been given to that question? Yeah, I mean, I can start. I, I mean, the nice thing about the school construction project, um, or the nice thing about uh, Fort River being the site, is that it's not, from what I can tell so far from what I've seen, is it's going to have, um, one of the reasons Fort River was chosen is because it has a smaller impact on kids in Fort, the Fort River school. There's more space to work with. They can keep some fields. It's not like, um, you know, if it was at Wildwood, the construction was going to be right on the back of the school, you know, potentially that could have been a, you know, deterrent for some families to stay in. Um, but with Fort River, it, again, what I've seen so far is there's, you, you can maintain a pretty good degree of separation between the existing Fort River school and where the new school will go um, in the construction area. So our hope is that, I mean, um, you know, Peter and, and Allison, I, I would hope that the goal is to not lose any students because of construction. All right. Peter? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, just real briefly, it, exactly what Sean said, not to open up the can of worms of site selection for the school building committee again, but one of the main benefits was a significant um, difference in, in the transition impact to students. Um, if anything, I would imagine over the construction period, we, we might see an increase in enrollment as, as um, families move in and anticipate their students being able to uh, have some number of years in, in what is going to be an amazing building. Uh -huh. Yeah. Allison? Yeah, what, what he said, but also, um, <laughs> but also we, we just had our school committee meeting last night and learned of a, a significant increase in, um, I, well, significant isn't the right word, an, an increase or unexpectedly larger enrollment at Fort River um, than originally anticipated in our budget. And um, part of that is due to Cominantis and Cominantis is gonna stay in Fort River even during construction. So as as Cominantis sort of moves up, I think it's the oldest grade is fourth grade right now. Um, we'll have fifth grade next year. So it, it's, there's enough going on and to Peter's point, the construction is not gonna impact that school nearly as much as it might, it could have in um, other situations. So um, I don't see it really having a, such a substantial impact that it would be, people would be char moving to charter simply because of that construction because we're yeah. not seeing it right now. And at least historically, um, it may be different now, the charter schools typically have entry points, you know, whether it be kindergarten, sixth grade, um, sort of point, points where that makes more sense. Um, and the elementary school in our area has like has a, sp a specific program where I don't think it's one where you kind of hop in, hop out. It's, um, you know, it's a language type program. So um, could it be with school choice change potentially, but I think the charter tuition one is, or the charter enrollment is probably less likely to fluctuate wildly. For construction, yeah. Okay, let's move on to our next topic, which is the FY23 budget, right, Sean? Yep. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. So one thing we said during the budget process was that we would um, come back and talk about um, our operating budgets in the fall, especially with final state aid numbers. The final state aid figures came in higher. Um, this was part of the conversation around um, the schools and, and uh, the, the um, arts enrichment uh, position they were looking at, but also just we had envisioned, we knew that there was this wide range between um, the governor's proposal for state aid and what the, the House and Senate were looking at for state aid, there was a pretty big gap. And so we went the conservative route, um, but we did sort of commit to coming back and looking at this again with final state aid numbers. So what I wanna run you through is um, our uh, sort of comparison of what we voted to what potentially could be a supplemental appropriation given the new state aid figures. Um, this is sort of the first time we're discussing this. So we wanted to get this group's input um, before we would potentially uh, bring this to the council. So nothing, so on, on the left-hand side, you got the voted and then the supplemental, not much has changed for the property taxes. Um, we're, not, we're not looking to make any adjustments right now to anything there, um, but again, state aid, we've updated. So the big changes were in the unrestricted government aid. Um, I think it would end up being a, we had budgeted somewhere around a 2.9 or 3% increase and end up being in the five. So it was a pretty significant increase um, to unrestricted government aid. Um, chapter 70 changed a little bit for the positive. Um, they did some, these are all final cherry sheet figures. Um, they made some final adjustments to charter assessment. There was also a pretty big increase to state-owned land. Um, again, it's nowhere near reflecting what we, you know, we all think we should get for state-owned land, but it was a 28% increase um, from where it was before. So the final state aid figures have been put in here and you can see it increased our state aid revenue by about 2.9% mostly in, from UGA and, and state-owned land. And the, the libraries as well. Right, you'll see um, in the offset receipts. So offset receipts means money that flows into the town that we then turn over and give to either the schools or the library. So in this case, school choice tuition, that's based on how many kids choose to come into the um, into our elementary school district that increased from the original estimate. So. Um, we end up giving them the actual amount that comes in. So if it changes again, it changes. But um, and then public libraries, that amount increased quite a bit relative to where it was. Um, so those amounts would come in and go straight to the library or straight to the schools. And they have revolving funds that they use to manage that. So on the revenue side, the, the change is just in state aid. 
on the expense side, I'll come back to operating budget in a second. Um, on the expense side, the first thing we do is we increase the assessment. So the, the aid went up, the assessments went up a little bit too. Um, so we've put in that new number and then the cherry sheet offsets, which is a wash with up above, it comes in and then it goes out. We've updated that to reflect the new figure. So when we did that, what was left over, um, we've determined that we can get pretty close. Um, I'm gonna have to make a, one other little adjustment but we can do a half percentage point increase to the operating budgets based on the, the higher state aid, which um, the nice thing with state aid is it's a relatively stable recurring revenue source. Um, even during the pandemic, it, at worst, it stayed flat. Um, and obviously revenues in the state have done much, much better than um, what was expected. Uh, so a so, so few of the reasons why we're, we're proposing this for consideration is um, one, we we all know how inflation has impacted sort of everyone's world. You know, whether you're paying for gasoline or utilities, um, or any, you know, things are harder to get. Whether you're paying for construction, you know, everything is more expensive nowadays. Um, and we sort of recognize that our original budget, you know, we didn't we we reflected inflation on the capital side. We didn't do anything additional for the operating side around inflation. Uh, the second, another reason would be. Um, the schools and the town all are funding, you know, all have federal grants at this point um, that are funding some level of recurring expenses that we hope to transition back into the operating budget and increasing the operating base um, now kind of sets that base higher and allows us to more easily fold that um, fold expenses back in in the future. Um, so for our, for the town, the primary expense that we're looking to fold back in over time would be the additional uh, four firefighters that we're funding through ARPA. And then the last reason to consider this is that we took a zero, the operating budgets took a 0% increase in FY21 due to COVID. Um, we never made up for that. You know, uh, salaries went up. You know, we still honored all the CPAs. Um, price costs still went up. They went up a lot, but we never went back and did any extra increase for operating budgets. They just, that base kind of carried forward. And so this wouldn't totally make up for that, but it would, it would help. Um, it would it would take a chunk out of that year where we saw no increases to operating budgets. Um, and that's it. So again, when I plug in that half percent, you know, there's a little bit of a variance here at the bottom that I would work with Sony to figure out how we would close that, but um, we could do a half percentage point. Um, and the reason why we're talking about this now is there's going to be some financial orders that will go to the council in the fall. We do free cash transfers and there's some other orders that will be considered. And so the time, if we are gonna do a supplemental appropriation and increase the operating budget, the time to do it is now before we set the tax rate. Um, because if we wanna, if we're gonna do it, we would do it, we'd build it into what we, um, into our recap for when we set the tax rate. So that's why we're bringing it to you now. And I'll leave this up on the screen if anyone wants to look at anything in particular. Okay. Comments or questions. So ultimately, it's up to the council to appropriate the funds to make this happen. Mandy? Yeah, just two questions. Um, the first one, it relates to almost FY24, which is some of these big increases in state aid. Do we expect those same numbers to sort of come in next year, or is this just a one off in terms of the UGA increase, you know, such that we'd be then adjusting our budgets down because we'd have even less state aid next year? That's question one. And question two, I see that on this list, the region district is on it. Um, we have an assessment. How does that work given that, you know, would we just be handing money to the region that the other region participants may not be doing? Um, how does that work? Um, Doug, do you want to answer the latter and then I can do the, or the yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that second question. We, we, um... <clears throat> we sort of posed that question. Um, I think it would, because it's outside the assessment and to actually increase the overall budget for the regional schools would require action by not only the council, but all three town meetings of the smaller towns. Uh, that's not likely to happen because they're not gonna meet in until next May, April and May. Uh, the other option would be for the, for the if Amherst would appropriate another, you know, 85, 845, you know, to uh, 85,000, uh, dollars to the regional schools. They, they could do it as a gift or donation. Uh, they would have to, you know, detail the, the constraints they'd want to put on that gift or donation. In other words, for what purpose? Um, and then we would be able to, to spend it in a gift or donation form uh, in, in the current fiscal year. So if, if the council were to do that, they would, they would have to give it to the, you know, to the, to the regional schools as gifts. It'd have to be accepted by the school committee. 
Um, and then of course, uh, you know, the intent or purpose of that would be identified when, when the donation is made. So just following up on your other, so, um, so Mandy Joe, based on what Doug said, for this current fiscal year, it would be the form of a gift or a donation, but then for the, from the following year, we would build it in, you know, this increase plus whatever increase was given to operating departments would be part of that assessment that then would trickle to the other towns as well. Um, so it would have to be, it'd be a one year sort of temporary thing with the region if, if this is approved. Um, and then your other question about the state aid. So, so I, I don't know anyone who anticipates state aid will go down. The increase will likely not be as large of an increase as it is this year. Although I'll say there's probably many out there still that are lobbying for a big increase because even the increase we got was nowhere what revenues exceeded the budget. I think it was like 20% <laughs> that revenues exceeded the budget. Um, well, we all know, we all seen the news about the, the sur surplus money is going back to, um, going back to taxpayers. So, um, so we don't anticipate state aid to go down again during the pandemic. State aid didn't go down. The worst they did was keep it flat. Um, and so again, the increase won't be 5.9%, but this should be in our base for state aid. Um, that being said, if there's a recession, you know, anything could happen. So I just, you know, I do want to caveat that. Andy? Yeah, on the last point, on uh, Next week, we have the uh, MMA Financial Policy Committee, and I think this will probably be a topic of um, discussion at that meeting. So I may have additional insight. Unfortunately, if I, if I do get any additional insight, it's after the fact of this meeting. Um, as far as uh, the first question that was asked, I've thought about it and wondered whether the appropriate, whether an appropriate thing to do, and I wanted to get feedback from everybody here, is to um, have that additional money allocated as um, towards the um, athletic fields. That we're trying to make donations to the athletics fields, we're trying to make it uh, for January. Uh, I think that it makes it a uh, uh, attractive reason to um, make that recommendation without having to get into the question of uh, making a donation above and beyond the uh, uh, the assessment and the whole politics with the other towns. Andy, are you saying the whole amount or just the the amount for the region? Just the amount for the region. Okay. Any spot, Lynn? Lynn? Um, my, uh, actually, I was wondering the same thing as Andy has just suggested. And the only thing that gives me pause is, as with everything else, we may find out that the cost is going to increase. And if the cost increases, this may end up being about the amount that we're going to have to pay to pay our share anyway. So I, if we're going to make it as a gift and we're and if we designate it for that um i want to make sure that we say in anticipate with with the possibility that it would cover any increases okay is there any anybody objecting to this or seeing any problems with using this increased state aid in this manner? Peter? No, no objection. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's, I think it's, a, I think it'd be, it should be received very well. I mean, a, an unexpected increase to our budgets when, you know, we've, all departments have, have had tough choices recently. I think it'd be very welcome and appreciate a very positive act by, by the town government. I don't see a lot of downside, you know, it's, clearly coming in in the FY23, you know, line. And so, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, don't, don't thank anybody yet. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm grateful for the, I'm grateful for the consideration. Okay. Yeah. Mandy. Yeah. I, I, I'm with Peter on that. I think the only question is how, what to do about the region because it's not simple. Yeah. Um, yeah. But my understanding is even if I just want to clarify, even if the council should decide to do instead of a gift, an allocation towards the athletic field, the intention would still be to base 
whatever increase in FY24 yeah. in the budgets would be based off the supplemental number, even if that 85 goes to the athletic fields. Is yeah, that correct? absolutely. So that so that it gets folded into their base going forward. And then and so also the other member towns can kind of maintain a contribution in proportion to what Amherst. So um so yeah, it would for the region it would have to be a quirky one time thing for FY23, but then we would catch it up for that that additional amount in FY24. Okay. So the next steps on this is that we would prepare, we have to do a, um, a forum, public forum for the council, and then have or proposed orders to the council, which would be automatically referred to the finance committee for its consideration with a recommendation to the council for its appropriation. So there, there's more steps to be involved, but we want to preview it with this group first. Okay, next topic is this uh, budget schedule for FY24. Yeah, so the, it's the last topic. It's really just to, I think, kind of coordinate um, calendars. Um, and maybe, Lynn, you may have this off the top of your head, the date for um, the financial indicators meeting. Actually, I think there were two things. So while Lynn's looking that up, and there's there's two pieces. I think one piece was just to make sure this group is aware um, that we have had a um, initial meeting with the regional school district, a working group around the assessment method for going forward. Um, Doug gave us some good information to consider um, that we don't, I guess the, the update here is that there's still more to be done around what the regional assessment will look like for FY24 and just a heads up that that could impact, um, hopefully it doesn't, but that could impact just sort of how things play out in FY24. Um, so we'll keep this group, we'll keep this group posted if there's any more there. Um, I think what we've communicated to the region is that we want to stick to the guidance that the town gives every year um, and and hope that the region will work within that amount. Um, but just to, again, if people aren't aware, we are having conversations around the assessment method. The, uh, fi the financial indicators meeting is at seven o'clock on November 7th. So that meeting, um, will be, that's technically a BCG meeting too, I believe. Um, um, yes. So we'll we'll go through all the financial indicators like we do every year, some of the, um, what people are used to seeing in terms of metrics, and then we'll have some sort of forecast for what we expect FY24 to look like from a revenue um, perspective. And that will kick off the budget guidance sort of discussion with the finance committee and the council. So if there's any input from library trustees, school committee, you know, it's a good time to provide that and the public forum on the budget will not happen until november 21st which is two weeks later and that's an, an initial an additional opportunity to weigh in on on the priorities for the council as well doug are there any um are there any other regional meetings scheduled at this point there's no date for four town meeting yet, I imagine, right? No, not yet. And and uh, I do want to have another guardrails meeting. I got to check on. I think I sent a doodle poll out, but if, I haven't gotten any responses, so I get the feeling that maybe it didn't actually <laughs> go out. So I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to sort of uh, double check to make sure that went out. So if you didn't see one or if Paul didn't see one, then then uh, I'll have to check to see if it it actually emailed what it was supposed to. So, um, but hopefully in the next week or so we'll do that kind of follow up meeting from from the earlier one, um, and then you know fairly soon knowing those dates that you guys have for those those meetings on your on your public forum and the uh the indicators of the november 7th that'll help us i mean traditionally we've had sort of the first saturday in in december is, is typically when we have a first four towns meeting that'll probably be when we do it again but i'll you know more to come okay anything else on the agenda sean uh, I'll even double check, but I think that is it. That's it. Okay, so the next time this group will meet will be at the financial indicators meeting on November 7th. So Nelson, please. Sorry, related to that, um, will that be a um, virtual meeting or in person? Uh, the council will be in person, although people will be allowed to attend virtually and I poll the council in advance. We also now have audience in the room, are loud in the room. 
And we will actually be starting at seven o'clock because that's, I mean, at five o'clock, that's our reading night for the town manager's evaluation. So some will be in person, some will be um, virtual. You're all welcome to attend virtually, but if some want to be in the room, you can certainly be in the room. The room does have a capacity limit on it. Okay. And we'll want to know that because we'll want to set it up so that, you know, you're sitting with mics and you're sitting so that you can also, you have to bring your laptops with you and uh, you have to be able to zoom in. Okay. Got it. Sorry. Just to, so is the whole town council at, at the, at that financial indicators meeting or? The whole town council attends and will already be attending, but I mean, it just depends on which night it is, how many are actually in the room and how many are virtual. Yes. So anybody can attend. It's a public meeting, obviously. Okay. Anything else, Sonia or Sean? Anything? Okay, so I will uh, adjourn this meeting at 4.20 or 5.23. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.